I think it's fair to say that Dark Souls 3 is largely seen as the best game in the Dark Souls subseries specifically. It's a crown jewel in a lot of ways. Dark Souls 3 was, in fact, my first experience ever with a FromSoft game at all. And, you know, as, as, as being my introduction to the Dark Souls series back in the days of my youth, you know, when I was a young man, I was initially very caught off guard by how seemingly difficult and unfair the game felt at first. And while this would potentially be an instant turnoff for some, and it certainly brought its own frustrations for a younger, less experienced me. And occasionally, again, not really knowing much about the game, it was frustrating enough where I would put it down for a while and not revisit it for maybe a couple of weeks or months. Man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna break my monitor, I swear. There was something about its unrelenting nature that made me more interested in it and always drew me back in. And so, with enough effort and persistence, and after dying countless times, I was finally able to complete my first ever Dark Souls game. Thank you for changing my life. I'm literally praising the sun. But because this was my first Souls game, even though I ultimately thoroughly enjoyed myself, I had no frame of reference for what I just played, and if it was a good experience compared to other things. And all these years later, and recently going back to experience the entire DS3 package along with its DLC, you know, despite being the third installment in this series, I, I, I really do feel like Dark Souls 3 is an awesome place to begin. In fact, I might even go so far as to say it is probably the best game to start with, as it's not like like insanely oppressive right at first it does a lot of really smart things that allow a player to figure out what's going on and it slowly eases them in into the mechanics that it's trying to teach them it might be the best game at doing that i'm not sure but it's certainly up there and so i want to explore exactly why that is but more to the point going back to this game with a bit a bit more of a watchful eye i tried to pay much deeper attention to all the little things that make up the experience the good and bad alike but in my opinion that's why i said dark souls 3 is far and away the crowned victor for its overall game design in the Dark Souls series specifically because it makes for one of the most refined, palatable, enjoyable, and rich experiences that a video game can offer you. There's quite a lot to unpack though. Dark Souls 3 is a deceptively loaded game, with some of the best designs for levels and bosses I feel like we've ever seen. And I think it's obvious to say, but Elden Ring is more or less the open world version of Dark Souls 3. So many ideas, lessons, and mechanics that Elden Ring does so well, I think it, it it largely learned from its bigger brother, Dark Souls 3. And it also should be pretty obvious that I absolutely adore this game. However, I still recognize that it isn't perfect, and Dark Souls 3 does have a couple, albeit fairly minor, blemishes and hindrances and flaws to the overall experience. For if it's a slightly flawed, it's also an insanely dialed in and well crafted by the same token. And while it was still always the same game, I had a totally different experience playing it at 19 years old than I did now at 25. There's so many subtleties to this game, its design, its combat progression, boss encounters, lore and story, and so much more that I didn't quite appreciate to the same degree as I did when I played it more recently. And not to mention, I had only played Dark Souls 3 before the DLC came out, you know, just the base vanilla game. So in replaying it, not only did I get to re-experience the base game, but I also got to play the Ashes of Arendelle DLC and the Ring City for the first time, and that was very excellent. So it was a wonderful game to revisit, and I think it really does hold up in current day, and it stands the test of time. And I'm going to dig deep into this game to understand why. And as always, I'll be talking everything I feel is relevant to Dark Souls 3, and we will be discussing bosses within their own dedicated sections as the video goes on. So with that being said, let's find out what makes Dark Souls 3 so special. The Dash. So I think it's probably good for us to begin with the world design. This is kind of like a good starting point, you know, because it kind of hangs the story and lore and, you know, the game makes certain choices either within its actual gameplay or level design that are done to accommodate that world. In other words, it's good to have a basic ground level understanding of the story and world design because it puts so many seemingly abstract and disconnected things into context. So the basic story of Dark Souls 3, without getting too caught in the weeds, is basically you are are an ashen one and you're on your journey to link the first flame this will require you to overcome many obstacles and enemies and challenges that many others have failed time and again at which is why you arise from the grave upon starting a new game coming from ash 
You must make your journey and rise to the occasion against the Lords of Cinder. While the Ashen One's goal is to link to First Flame, what he may choose to do with that power is ultimately up for you to decide, as Dark Souls 3 does have a multitude of unique endings. While the journey has been attempted many times, that doesn't deter you from fighting valiantly the whole way through. Now, something I noticed very quickly when replaying Dark Souls 3, in my personal opinion, I don't think the world design and set pieces and locations are as visually or thematic thematically striking as something like Bloodborne or even Elden Ring. And I'm not talking about how this game has a few locations from past Dark Souls games that are kind of like built into the level design, but more to the point, I feel like there's much less distinct visual variety or like unforgettable aesthetics than those games. And I know that sounds like a harsh criticism to Dark Souls 3, but it's not really, because Bloodborne and Elden Ring are a masterclass in that area. Bloodborne has that unforgettable HP Lovecraft influence that resonates throughout its world. It's unmistakable and stands out when compared to anything else. Elden Ring has a lot of that like one-of-a-kind George R. R. Martin weird brain stuff, and whether you like those styles or not, it's not really the point. You cannot deny that they at least aren't very memorable in their own ways. I'm not saying Dark Souls 3 world design is bad at all, it's just simply a testament to how great those games did it by comparison. I'm, I'm just saying Dark Souls 3 in certain regions feels a little bit more generic when just, I guess, comparing them side by side. Once again, not even really a harsh criticism, I'm just saying that a lot of Dark Souls 3 world design is like, oh, a, another variation of some kind of like room ruins, right? That's that's a lot of the aesthetic, and that's fine. That's what they're going for, but you get what I mean. It just feels slightly more generic in comparison to those games. That being said, it's still incredible in its own way, absolutely. It's got some gorgeous vistas, some unbelievably striking visuals, and skyboxes specifically, and its soundtrack is one of my favorite, period. In many cases, I think it's the highlight of the game's overall style is the actually the music, and I suppose it's a bit of a trade-off, since again, to me, subjectively, while there was some bright spots here and there, I actually found Elden Ring's soundtrack to be a little generic and forgettable at times, but on the other hand, I think it happens to be one of Dark Souls 3 strongest suits. And not to mention, I really love this game's color palette and their use of color throughout the game. Like, it's not just this gray and, and brown beige like slathering of the entire game. It's a lot of that stuff, but it's like heavily contrasted with some like, you know, really deep and pretty blues in the sky of the Boreal Valley or the, you know, really sharp orange in the sky near Lothar Castle. That was another big thing that really stuck out to me when playing it again, is I love this game's color palette. It's so pretty, and they use color very effectively throughout the game. That's one of the things that makes this game so easy to play, and I don't mean easy in a difficulty sense, I mean easy in, in a way where it's just good to look at. You want to continue to play the game because you like looking at it, that's, that's kind of what I mean. But when it comes to core player mechanics and combat more broadly, Dark Souls 3 takes a new, updated approach to things, and objectively improves on some previous choices. For example, jumping in Dark Souls 3 can now be mapped to a different button so that you're not accidentally inputting it in combat. Maybe still not quite as good as having a dedicated jump button like they would do later on, but it was a really good step in the right direction. Also, Dark Souls 3 first introduced the blue mana bar, because previously, when using magic, your uses for that were hard numbered. So, no matter what you did for any like spell or, or ability or whatever, they just had a hard limit, but Dark Souls 3 gives the player more agency about how they play. Want to approach the game almost entirely relying on magic? Great, you know, you can do that, spec into having more Ashen Estus flasks instead, and you'll get way more mileage out of all of your spells and abilities. Want to play just more of like a melee build with very little magic, if at all? You can also do that too, without being punished for playing a different way. Of course, we also see this approach in Elden Ring, which it very clearly iterated on that original idea. Another fundamental mechanic that Elden Ring refined from Dark Souls 3 is the input button buffering or action queuing. It's somewhat hard to articulate or convey how different they feel without actually playing them side by side, but to sum up, Dark Souls 3 has very long buffering windows, which means if you push a button during an animation, that action will come out next after a slight delay. In theory, this is great, but what you realize is for certain weapon classes, the, it's sometimes the difference between a loss and a win. Like, if, if your greatsword, for example, queues up another swing when you actually wanted to roll away in, after the first light attack instead. These, like, highly laggy, very committal options can come out unintentionally, and there's no real way to cancel them. 
I think Elden Ring made the buffering windows a little smaller, since while it's not perfect, it feels much more responsive and fluid in that game. But this problem is the worst and the most obvious when trying to pull off certain offensive combos that have very tight inputs, and trying to pick a defensive option immediately after. This greatly discourages mashing and requires you to deliberately think about the buttons you're going to push, which I totally agree with, but my whole point is that its execution is a little less polished compared to, say, Elden Ring. It's one of those things you don't even think about when it's working well, and it's only noticeable when it's a slight problem, and that's why I noticed it again, because I probably didn't think about it at the time, but after playing it in Elden Ring and then playing Dark Souls 3 again, it became very obvious. But once again, it was a pretty minor problem for me in the grand scheme of things. And actually, just one more thing. I want to say about that I think they're fair comparisons because the overall combat pacing is the most similar to Elden Ring they, fair, they, they they share very similar framework so I think it's relevant and I love Dark Souls 3's combat so much no matter what kind of build you're using there's this whole plethora of tools to especially zero in on exactly how you want your character to play and feel there's room for much more aggressive you know in your face kind of play or slightly slower paced but more reactionary play in any case, you'll find a bunch of ways that the game goes out of their way to suit your preferred playstyle. However, because Dark Souls 3 is still a ultimately much more linear game, it does a better job at having a good barometer on how tough a boss or level should be by the time the player arrives there in most cases. For example, there's a few hard checkpoints that you cannot pass before entering a new area of the game. You know, for example, w whether you go from the Road of Sacrifices straight to Deacons of the Deep or the Abyss Watchers, while they're found in totally different areas, you can't actually progress any further until both of them are beaten. You have to backtrack to them either way, and these areas don't really do anything to connect into one another, so there is going to be a lot of backtracking no matter which way you approach it, but one of them gives you access to this underground ground area that will allow you to progress further and the other one has an item that blocks you off from the boreal valley until it's obtained this prevents the player from being dramatically over or under leveled for bosses in areas like may happen in an open world game that you could just farm like elden ring it is a double-edged sword and each approach has its clear advantages and drawbacks but all things considered i do think dark souls 3 does an excellent job at feeling layered but still giving the player agency and choice even if it feels sort of like an illusion sometimes despite most of the level design being fairly linear but something i really think ds3 does a superb job at for the most part when it comes to levels are actually the routings that are baked into them helpful shortcuts that you can discover small side puzzles or little areas with neat items to reward a curious and brave eye all of these things are bread and butter of what makes the Dark Souls 3 level design really stand out when done right. However, admittedly, there's a few areas of the game that feel a little underdeveloped, uh, maybe stretched out or bloated, have some strange choices, or are just straight up tedious in some ways. But there's a bit of, you know, copy paste stuff here and there that's used throughout the game, but it is done pretty sparingly or in a way where it's, you know, kind of like thematically fine and I, I can, you know, I can excuse it. It doesn't hurt the experience too much, but despite the level and the enemies you encounter being you know mostly linear or tuned for that region it still does feel so good rewarding in exploring every little path illusory wall or other side road that you'll find along the way most of the time all these levels end in a dead end room without any loops or connections to other areas this is an aspect of the game that upon replaying it i felt was a small hindrance so, for example, when you beat bosses such as Deacons of the Deep or Aldrich or the Twin Princes, sometimes you hit a dead end and you're like, where am I supposed to go next? Like, in a frustrating way. It works in an open world game because a lot of the time it's more like presented as an open question. It's a curious, where should I go next, right? You're exploring, that's, that's the point. But in more linear level design, when you're focused on progressing the game, you need to be in a very specific place. And that's not always conveyed well, in my opinion. It's like, imagine this example. You're driving in a car trying to get somewhere specific right you have a destination you want to be if you accidentally take a wrong turn or get lost that's frustrating that's not you know exploration that's being annoyed now when you're getting in your car with the intention of just driving around and you know enjoying the view seeing what's out there exploring that's the exploration stuff i'm talking about but dark souls 3 is the former rather than the latter this is like you need to be somewhere to progress but it's not always clear where you're supposed to be or how you're supposed to get there but it was again a little little bit of a problem but not exactly game breaking 
Also, I have to mention another example of Elden Ring learning from Dark Souls 3 is when it comes to getting more and upgrading your Estus flasks. I'm not trying to say that this was like a huge deal breaker for me either, but it's like getting the Estus shards for more flasks and the undead bone shards for more powerful ones. They kind of just like appear as regular items that aren't denoted by anything special. And again, that's that's fine, I suppose, for the most part. But I do like how Elden Ring did it with the golden trees for flask charges and sacred tears for making them more effective. The golden trees were very easy to spot and they stuck out amongst the background and the churches were like this very specific kind of geography that you knew that you were going to get something rewarding inside of it. These massively important items can just be in totally arbitrary spots and blend in with like everything else. Not a massive issue, just more of an observation. For the most part, the world feels like it's progressing on your journey and the way that's conveyed is excellent, but sometimes it can be a little clunky particularly with the level layouts they can really be all over the place some are amazing and some are kind of rough like for example I love the ringed city in general but the ashes of Arendelle DLC in terms of like level layout and structure and how you get around that area I honestly wasn't super impressed with some of the levels feel a bit annoying to traverse but on the whole they're excellently laid out and paced in terms of getting around Dark Souls 3 does a great job at implementing shortcuts there's some in the game that are pretty Pretty much required to play said level and they are giant advantages. I think the starting area, the high wall of Lothric, the boreal valley, and the ringed city are standouts when it comes to this aspect. The genius placement of shortcuts and rewards are so well thought out and executed. The way that you can get around obstacles once you sort of know exactly where to go, but you need to, you know, experiment with the level to figure those things out. What I mean is most of the time you can't get these great rewards in the form of shortcuts without interacting with a lot of the mechanics and enemies that that the level is conveying to you. You can't really skip a whole lot. You can, but it's going to cost you in the long run. And, you know, it's that perfect balance of feeling brutal, but rewarding you proportionally for all that pain. The reward is pretty much always worth the time and effort required, which is why it feels so damn good to play, especially when you unlock some kind of really clutch shortcut in a particularly challenging area. While no matter which way you go, you'll ultimately land at the same end point for sure, but, you know, it's, it's basically split paths within paths is the core level philosophy and I love this for Dark Souls 3 so much and even better there's a couple of secret areas that you can access for example the arch dragon peak with this like dragon gesture that you need to like sit down at this thing and it takes you to this entire beautiful sunbathed area with some extra secret bosses and such just this entirely unexplored level that you can just get access to and you know the level layouts aren't perfect they can be a little bit inconsistent in terms of gimmicks pace and quality but even the level I don't particularly like they all have great moments here and there or otherwise purposeful choices that really enhance the overall tone that the game is going for hey if you haven't already click subscribe it's totally free road to a million souls you already know what's going on now, of course, every little central hub world that you're going to find yourself in a Souls game, I actually think Dark Souls 3 has one of the better implementations. The Firelink Shrine is easily top tier, in, in my opinion, in the way that it's set up and that you can interact with it. However, it isn't perfect, but some of its shortcomings or more so minor inconveniences get highlighted when you see what Elden Ring changed specifically. For example, in Elden Ring, you can level up, uh, change Estus flasks, etc., all at the Site of Grace, but in Dark Souls 3, you can't add or change Estus flasks or level up without going back to Firelink Shrine and talking to the Firekeeper or the other guy. Again, maybe I can kind of understand this because Elden Ring is such a big game in terms of scale that they don't want you constantly zipping back and forth between, you know, the open world stuff you're doing and then going back to like the round table hold. That would be extremely inconvenient and annoying, but it does mean that you're going to be revisiting the Firelink Shrine quite frequently, especially more so than something like the round table. Again, not necessarily a huge problem. I guess I'll just leave it at the fact that it kind of makes me appreciate being able to do these things at the Grace or, or Bonfire even more, especially when I just want to do something really simple or, or minor. But I will say, I quite enjoy the sense of escalation and grandiosity that builds up as you claim the Lords of Cinder and their flame. The game has such a well-paced buildup and it's visually conveyed brilliant here to me. There are these checkpoints for progression in the form of bosses, which we'll get to those in a second, but it's also a key factor for almost all of the side quests and character quest lines in the game. They kind of all visit the Firelink Shrine at some point and you kind of like interact with them there 
as they go about their journey in the world. So I suppose it makes sense why they'd want you to return to the shrine pretty frequently. However, Dark Souls 3 has a durability mechanic that was featured in games past, except here they tried to get rid of all of the annoying things about it. And you know, there's a billion ways to restore durability now, going back to the shrine, repair powders, etc. And when all of this is taken into account, the durability mechanic is almost totally pointless in this game. It's not a chore here, thank God, but, you know, we come to the conclusion that it has no real reason to exist at all, which is almost certainly why they did away with it entirely in Elden Ring, which, again, I'm very okay with. Not exactly a bad mechanic, just a little redundant and pointless, and I think they realized that the game was evolving in a way where that mechanic just didn't have a place in Dark Souls anymore, and, you know, again, I think that's fine. But the one thing I will say I really do like as a mechanic is the gems and the upgrading system, where you get these Titanite shards, and I otherwise like other elemental gems for different things. Now, I will say it could do with being slightly more straightforwardly conveyed, in my opinion. I think they've come a long way with making this system uh, a little bit more easy to understand. I don't mind a complicated or intricate system, but if you can convey it to the player in a way where they can at least understand what they're interacting with, then I think that goes a long way with making the experience feel better. It's kind of what Elden Ring did. The Ashes of War system definitely simplified the experience where you can now tell exactly what kind of damage is going to be applied to your weapon. It's a little bit obscure and opaque in Dark Souls. It's just the UI, I think, is a little bit runaround, and that's fine, but it means for new players especially, they're going to have no idea like what kinds of gems do what on their weapon or what trade-offs it's going to come with stuff like that they're probably just going to throw a, a gem on because it looks or sounds cool and have no clue what it's actually doing to their weapon and i feel like that's a little bit of a problem that some future games have solved and that's good but in terms of player progression all of the systems on the whole i absolutely love i know it sounds like i'm kind of being like nitpicky or whatever but i'm just they're just minor critiques and there's stuff that i noticed and observed but for the most part literally everything works perfectly and it's buttery smooth it's very sleek that's why the gameplay I think feels the most welcoming to new players. It's it's just a very sleek experience. And also, I should say, it's very friendly for doing multiple playthroughs. Of course, you're going to experience the same levels and bosses in roughly the same order, and that's fine, but there's also a bunch of different endings that you can go for. And what's really fun about it is that depending on which ending you pursue, you can change the music of the shrine, and giving it this, like, much different emotional tone and feel than when you first stumbled across it. It can go from feeling like this safe haven to a melancholy, like, somber waiting room in the blink of an eye. Now, to be fair, I did say earlier that an entire secret area of the game the untended graves is pretty much just like the starting area with the firelink shrine but they just reuse it you know a bit later in the game i'm okay with it here since it feels and plays so different and you even fight gundir here again although with a slight different variation from the original boss but putting it in a new context of all of the ashen that failed to link the first flame and you can kind of see the fate of it all here it's just a it's a very different tone and experience and i love almost everything about the firelink shrine design wise and storytelling wise so I think it's safe to say that there is a ton that Dark Souls 3 gets right when it comes to just player progression and fundamental basic game design. But again, the real gem of these games are the bosses. And I noticed when I was playing Dark Souls 3 again, because because when I played it the first time, I really had no frame of reference for if the bosses were good or not. I just didn't really think about them in that way necessarily at the time. But now I played Dark Souls 3 again in every single boss, and I can honestly say there's really no bad bosses exactly there's a few that i you know don't particularly love or whatever but there was none that i like outright disliked like in some other games i don't think i had a bad experience with any boss at all like there's a few that i'm a little indifferent to that were just like uh you know whatever they're they're fine but they're they they didn't present any kind of like real problem or i wasn't getting annoyed with them and then the ones that i really do like i really liked like they're standouts so i think those are literally the gems of this game is the the, you know, peak boss fight experience, but there was none that I actually felt like were, were bad in any way. That being said, when I put them side by side, we definitely have to rank order the good ones from the maybe not as good ones, but that's, in order to do that, we're going to have to dive deep into bosses, so let's do that.
I always find it interesting to see what boss FromSoft will determine fit to start the game with, and I feel like in a lot of ways the tutorial boss should show you the ropes of what you can expect for boss fights, generally speaking, as the game goes on. And Udix Gundir does that, I think, but in a very interesting way. It's like you start the fight and it seems pretty straightforward, he's just swinging his halberd around, and you can dodge them if you kind of like, you know, it's, it's a little intuitive that way, it feels good to play, but then all of a sudden he has a phase 2 where like the, the abyss lizard comes out of his thing and you're like oh my god I no clue what this game is on about right now he gets way more powerful he has a lot more range and you're like okay well I actually need to kind of respect his options now and I think it does a good job of you know putting the player in their place in some sense a new player might find him quite challenging, but not in a way that feels unfair, and also, I feel like this does a good job at, like, rewarding you. If you do a little exploration before you come into this fight, if you just keep losing over and over again, you can find some fire bombs, and you can throw them at him for extra damage that actually do quite a lot and will, you know, assist you in the fight. So, that kind of tells the player, hey, there's a lot of things probably in the world that, you know, I can use against future bosses if I'm particularly struggling on them, and I actually should be paying attention to these kinds of things. So, I do think the tutorial boss in Dark Souls 3 is really well done. I like Udix Gundir quite a lot. If I had any criticism for Udix Gundir, it's that his second phase moves feel a little less intuitive and, like, responsive about, like, what his threat range is compared to his first phase, but it's, like, that's a very, very minor complaint. I'm really digging at something because, in on paper, I think this, this fight is just, like, damn near perfect. The next boss you're gonna face is Vort of the Boreal Valley, and to be honest with you, I'm not particularly in love with this boss, and, in fact, I think it's kind of weird to have a boss like this so early on in the game. This introduces the player to the frostbite mechanic which you know is a strange choice considering you don't get introduced to that mechanic through the world design beforehand fighting this thing i guarantee you most brand new players who knew nothing about this game have no clue what the frostbite mechanic was doing to them or how to counterplay it and he's pretty much like a big truck if he if he if he hits you you're going to eat a ton of damage but he's also not too difficult just to get behind him and start d dishing out some damage yourself he's not a particularly hard boss exactly i feel like it just makes more sense to introduce this fight later in the game. I think there's some actually like mid-game bosses that would have been better suited for, you know, the early game of Dark Souls 3, but that's just my opinion. I think he's fine. I think he's fairly fun, but I'm just, I guess, a little indifferent. I don't love him and I don't really dislike him either. He's, he's pretty okay. Next up, you might consider uh, uh, another another low tier, or, okay, I'm just gonna say it, I'm just gonna say it, this fight is mid. The Curse Rod of Greatwood is a interesting gimmick fight, but I feel like it may be my least favorite in the game. Now, to be fair, it is not a mandatory boss, this is totally optional, you know, you, do, you have to do it for some, like, side quest stuff, but you don't necessarily need to kill this boss to beat the game. However, I think the main problem with this boss is it kind of overstays its welcome, like, the gimmick is funny or whatever at first, right? You gotta hit the these like vulnerable spots and very specific areas of its body to deal damage like these like pus filled things and again that's fine and then even midway through the fight the entire floor breaks through and that's pretty cool but once you've done that once like you start realizing how annoying all of his other moves are he has like this area of effect attack where you can't really be close to those vulnerable positions and also he has this move that deals absurd damage that feels it comes out way too fast like it feels like you almost can't react to it if you're in a bad position it's an entertaining fight visually, I guess. It looks cool, but I think mechanically it's a little dull for me, but I don't outright hate it once again. It's just like kind of uh, whatever. I think it may be my least favorite fight in the game. Next boss you're going to encounter is the Crystal Sage, and again, this is like the first boss that really heavily relies on magic in your first genuine taste of that stuff, and for what it's worth, I do like this fight a lot. Again, a little gimmicky, like the Crystal Sage will replicate itself. You got to find the right one. It kind of has like a different color, and then you can track them down. It's fun. It's cool. I actually have no problems with this fight. I just th it's not the most interesting one in the game, but it's I would say it's definitely better than Vort and also the Curse Rotted Cratewood for sure. But all things considered, I think it's still pretty middle of the road for me. It's and you do encounter it later in the game as a normal enemy, which again I understand why they do it, but it always kind of irks me when it happens. It makes them feel less special in their own individual encounters. It's just the first fight in the game where you have to deal with a lot of variables, meaning like the other replicants it spawns or like you know, 
other minions, etc., and even the magic that it's putting out. So as long as you're paying attention to just pacing yourself, this fight is really not hard at all. It's and it's you know fairly entertaining. I do like it. It's just on the lower end for me, I think. After that, however, we encounter our first real high tier fight in the game, in my opinion. It's easily one of the best in the game. The Abyss Watchers are excellent. I don't think I would change almost anything about this fight. So the way it opens up is you're fighting one single Abyss Watcher. They have like a dagger and also a great sword. They're pretty aggressive and they do swing a lot. Eventually, a second one will spawn in. You wait long enough, a third one will spawn in and start fighting the others, including the main boss you do have to take down. And essentially, you have a couple ways you can approach this. You can wait and then let them fight each other and wear down each other's health or you can be aggressive and try to fight them all off at the same time either way the pace of this fight is absolutely excellent and even if you manage to take down the first abyss watcher it's not over because it essentially absorbs all the souls of the others and becomes its second phase in which it has a flaming great sword and is far more aggressive not to mention, this boss is absolutely brutal at punishing more passive play. You really have to get comfortable with being up in its face and maybe trading hits or just dealing damage in the small windows in which it's, you know, in some end lag. It's a little bit dif more difficult to do in Phase 2, but also you don't get bailed out by having a second Abyss Watcher to distract them. Phase 2, you got to do all on your own, but I love this fight. It's probably one of the highest tier in the game for me easily. After that, we come to Deacons of the Deep, and admittedly, I like this fight significantly less than Abyss Watchers. I think that probably goes without saying, but it is this kind of gimmick fight done right. I played Bloodborne recently, and I compare this a lot to Rom's fight, where you kind of have to, like, kill these minions before you can deal damage to the main thing you need to kill. But this is done way better, because number one, they're at least slightly aggressive. They will kind of approach, and you can kind of, like, maneuver and, and manipulate them in a way where it opens up to you to the, uh, the actual center you need to deal damage to you don't necessarily need to worry about eliminating all of the smaller minions basically one carries like this red soul and they pass it around to different members after you kill them so you just are like tracking down this thing the whole time it's a lot of fun again sort of a gimmicky fight but i'm totally okay with it here and it's important to mention this fight carries a necessary item for game progression so it's completely mandatory you have to beat this one but when you encounter it you'll be like okay that was cool N maybe not necessarily the most interesting fight but it does exist after that, we have High Lord Wolnir, and this fight thematically and atmospherically is immaculate. I think it's great, but the actual mechanics of this fight are honestly nothing to write home about. I feel like it's probably just as low for me as something like Curse Rotted Greatwood, or I would say even Vort is better than this. This is actually probably maybe bottom three for me in Dark Souls 3. It's just like, again, I get what they're going for. It's just not a very special or memorable fight outside of its, you know, unique vision. Take that stuff away, and this is the most mechanically simple and dull fight you've ever done. Not to mention, its offensive options can just feel really weird and jank sometimes, and it's like, kind of, I don't know, it feels like a little bit of a chore boss to get through, but they definitely get better from this point on. Next up is actually an optional boss, and this is the Old Demon King. This is found in the Smoldering Lake area, and at first, I thought this boss was just kind of mid and even low tier, but the more I fought it and paid attention to it, I, it's a little more interesting and depthful than I thought. It's no high tier boss for me. It's not exactly like my favorite in the game. Also important important to mention you fight a bunch of like smaller minion versions of this before you actually get to the old demon king himself in a way it does kind of deflate the entrance that this could have had this one has a lot more uh, creative moves and it's significantly more dangerous for sure and the mechanics of this fight are at least kind of interesting it has a couple cool mix mix ups but nothing too crazy it's powerful but once you kind of figure out exactly where you need to be for everything it's pretty standard i would say Old Demon King does have a phase two in which he gets far stronger, and that is another thing that adds a little bit of fun and interesting mechanics to this fight, but once again, I can't honestly sit here and tell you that it's one of the better ones in the game. I do like the arena that it's in. Like, I like the, the, the atmosphere in which this takes place, and the fact that it's an optional boss doesn't make it outright offensive if it's not the most interesting thing you've ever played in the world. I like it a lot. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty good. But up next, we finally start getting into the really good bosses in Dark Souls 3. There's a giant leap in, like, quality once you get past this point in the game. We get to Pontiff Sullivan, and my god, chap, this fight is just so good. 
Bro, really think he Darth Revan from Star Wars, but in all seriousness, this fight is easily top five in Dark Souls 3, for sure. Mechanically, atmospherically, and otherwise. It's got a banger soundtrack, first of all, but its actual mechanics are what make this fight so unique and special. He has two swords, of course, that are magic, and one of them come out a lot faster than the other, and they have different ranges and different attack methods. But if that wasn't enough, with his fast and aggressive attacks, he also will summon a phantom version of himself that will do the exact same things and he gets a bigger move set as the fight goes on so if that sounds difficult that's probably because it is i think this is the first like giant roadblock that new players will encounter if they've had a decent time with all the other bosses this will probably be the first one that will stump an inexperienced player for quite a while but not in a bad way like once you learn its whole move set and you know you can adapt to its more aggressive nature and kind of stay in its face and within its threat range but avoiding the attacks then you're going to be absolutely Absolutely golden. I noticed upon replaying it, I kind of forgot a lot of his moveset, but I still remembered fundamentally kind of how it worked. So it was, it, it came back to me in a sense. It's like riding a bike. This is the very pinnacle of difficult without being unfair. Like this is a great blueprint for a fight that doesn't rely on any stupid gimmicks to kill you or like just to catch you off guard. Like so many bosses, I feel like tend towards uh, doing that. But Pontiff is very straightforward. It's just, hey, here's the fight. If you can execute it, get it done congratulations and I, I just think it's excellent I cannot you know gush over this more about how good it literally is and right after that you know if pontiff was just very you know straight to the point pure sauce no gimmicks Yorm the giant is the exact opposite it's all gimmick and almost no sauce and and again not really in a bad way I get it every game has has their gimmick fight to some degree and it even gives you a weapon for doing this one yes technically you can do this without storm ruler but just have fun smacking away at this thing for like a couple of hours with a very limited moveset. It's it's very clearly meant to be played with this weapon, and again, thematically, I like it, but I cannot honestly say that this fight is the most memorable or interesting thing outside of the visuals. His moves have slow windups, and it feel like they are not active for that long, so he's very easy to dodge. Like, he's he looks significantly more dangerous than I feel like he, he is, and that kind of deflates the tension that I think a boss of this scale could have. Like, I guess, like, the difference is, like, Rykard and Elden Ring, yes, you, it is a gimmick fight with the same idea, but I feel like Rykard's a little more dangerous. There's there's a lot more going on there than with Yorm, and again, it is what it is. I feel like they learned from that, but uh, this fight's fine. It's just a thematic fight, I suppose, but that's really about it. Right after that, however, you may go directly into Dancer of the Boreal Valley, and I don't have a ton to say about this one to be fair it's like standard in a way that's good i think it's a fight that is interestingly paced she doesn't honestly move around very fast but she has incredibly long and active moves she has very sweeping hitboxes and a deceptively long range and moves that just feel like they don't stop, but she also has a, a lot of end lag on moves too and is not massively aggressive, so you can find a lot of these windows to punish and this fight should not give you much trouble. Usually people will just one and done this, but it's fine. I like it. I just don't have a ton to say about it. However, I do have a lot to say about the next mandatory fight, Aldrich, Devourer of the Gods. Uh, this fight, how do I say this lightly? I mean, I, I guess I would just say... It's bullshit. I'm just messing around. It's not that bad. It's just like, it's one of those fights where it's actual attacks kind of don't really make sense or like in a way where you don't know it's swinging and it has some of the hardest hitting moves in the game. I just think the animations for this fight are a little weird. I like his move set. Like it's definitely unique. It's varied. He kind of gets different moves in, in phase two and stuff like that. I love the variety that's within it, but I just feel like some of his hardest hitting attacks, whether it's like his tail or his actual sword, it's just like the animations feel really weird. I don't really know how else to put it. It's fine. I'm just being, you know, I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit. I guess I would just say if Aldrich had like slightly cleaner animations and it's what it was doing was maybe a little bit more telegraphed and I, I would be okay with its massive damage output so long as I know what I'm fighting against. It's fun and again, thematically, atmospherically, I do like it a lot. I just can't say it's one of my favorites. So next up is not a mandatory fight, but this is my boy Osiris or o Oseros. How the hell do you say that? Anyways, I'm gonna be honest. This fight is largely the same archetype as Vort of the Boreal Valley. Uh, Osiris is just the more cracked out version of him. So there's not, I don't have a ton to say about him, to be honest. Like he has the same like charge attacks, even the frostbite mechanic. Largely, it's the same idea. It's just Osiris is far more dangerous than Vort is. 
He does have a phase two in which, you know, he turns up in the same way, you know, kind of goes crazy. But otherwise, if you just stay, like, under him, sort of, like, near his stomach, he can't really do much to you. I mean, in phase two, he has, like, claw moves that do punish, like, close-range behavior. And he has a charge attack that is pretty lethal. But otherwise, as long as you're, like, staying kind of under him, he's not particularly dangerous. And so I think he's fine. It's just kind of the same, like, almost copy-paste archetype as Vort. It is what it is. Oh, actually, and speaking of copy-paste, the fight directly after Osiris, is going to be champion Gundyr. Or I'm being facetious. Like, I'm not actually upset that they kind of reuse this fight. Champion Gundyr is different to Udix Gundyr in the way where he doesn't have the Abyss switch up in Phase 2. But Champion Gundyr has a lot more finesse and mix-ups in his actual moveset this time with his Halberd. I actually prefer this fight to the original tutorial fight. I think Champion Gundyr's moves feel a lot more intuitive. He has an actual large number of different kinds of moves he can employ and even mix-ups within those. This fight never gets boring. I honestly wish I could have, like, just played this more. It's, like, kind of annoying to get to in the game because it's kind of far into, into it, but it's also in a non-mandatory area, but it's so much fun. It's actually probably one of the better ones, in my opinion. His combo game is strong, it's aggressive, but it's nothing you can't deal with, and it feels rewarding when you actually succeed. Now, assuming you go to the next secret area, then you'll end up at the uh, Arch Dragon Peak and you'll fight the Ancient Wyvern. I'm going to be honest, lads. I don't have much to say about this fight. It's very gimmicky in the way that you're supposed to, like, jump down from this thing and, like, do a plunge attack. I get that. But if you fight the enemy normally and kind of just, like, run around under it, have fun. It's going to be... It's going to be a journey. We'll just say that. Like, this fight, it's, like, eh, it's it's whatever. It's low tier for me. Again, very gimmicky. If you just want to do the thing, that's fine. But, honestly, don't have much to say about him. But you'd be wrong in thinking that the Ancient Wyvern is all Arch Dragon Peak has to offer. It also houses quite possibly the most difficult fight in all of Dark Souls 3. Obviously, that's debatable. But in terms of completion rate, the Nameless King, according to, like, game trophies and everything like that, and just the community at large, the Nameless King fight, statistically speaking, has the lowest completion rate in the game, meaning this is what people struggled on the most. Now, that's accomplished through, I, I would say, somewhat controversial methods. Uh, the first phase of this game where you're fighting the Nameless King on his, like, Drake thing or whatever is okay, but the biggest problem is you're fighting the camera most of the time because this thing just moves around too much. In order to deal damage, you have to hit it sort of while its head is sitting still. You can hit it on other parts of the body, but it just moves around so erratically, and it's like, it feels like your weapon can't even reach it a lot of time. The camera is a genuine nightmare, and I think that's most people's issue with at least phase one phase two is much better i love this part Nameless King Phase 2 is everything you want in a Dark Souls boss. It's punishing, but it's it's something you can find the rhythm of, you can download it, you can learn the moveset, and when you do and you learn how to respond to everything, it feels so damn rewarding. It's obviously one of the most difficult fights in the game, but if you can get past the, uh, I guess, really janky camera and somewhat gimmick stuff, especially in the first phase, Phase 2 is such a highlight and is easily a top 5 fight in this game period for me. But if you happen to do Nameless King first, then you're kind of prepared already for what the next mandatory fight is going to be, because it's kind of like Nameless King Jr., or like, uh, honestly, like the Walmart version. Not in a bad way, though. Again, Dragon Slayer Armor is the next mandatory boss, and this one's weird. Like, it's partially a gimmick fight, but also kind of a saucy fight at the same time. This fight is certainly unique, because the environment you're in is actually destructible, and this plays a role in the projectiles that can also hit you during this fight. So Dragon Slayer Armor can, can break the walls near you and the cool thing is the projectiles actually have an audio cue that you can react to when i was playing this fight again i was like it would actually be so easy to make this fight totally obnoxious but they managed to avoid that and even make a really fun fight i enjoy this encounter so much they do use him as a regular enemy in the dlc which once again does somewhat deflate the the grandiosity of the original boss but i think it's okay here and i really do think that this is a pretty like higher tier fight for me but I have to say, the entire last act of Dark Souls 3, the entire late game, all the bosses are so excellent, and continuing that trend, honestly, the Twin Prince fight is maybe my favorite fight in the whole game. Like, I love the Nameless King and everything, and some in the DLC, which we'll get to, but as far as base game goes, I think this is easily best fight in the game, period.
the dance of this fight in phase one is unmatched when you're just fighting Lothric it's like he has moves that are very intuitive to respond to and it just feels rewarding and then he could do this thing where he teleports and you just need to slightly delay your defensive option to continue the dance of the fight it's like you get into this rhythm there's a slight disruption in the in the rhythm if you adapt to that you get rewarded and then in phase two when Lorian gets added he just it's the exact same pace of fight he just has a couple extra moves that are added to the toolkit. I think I may even go so far as to say this fight is perfect. I don't think there's a single thing I would change about this particular boss fight. Not even anything minor that I can really think of. Now, it, it's also interesting because Lorian can revive Lothric if you kill him first. And he can do this indefinitely until you kill Lorian. And you can do this in a way where like, you can just kill uh, Lothric multiple times over, then deal damage to Lorian. Or you can just wait to position yourself behind Lothric during his end lag and then punish Lorian for that so you don't have to keep killing them multiple times it's so damn good man i literally cannot express how much i love this fight even despite the fact that it is a gimmick fight technically speaking with the whole revive mechanic i don't mind at all this fight is like so phenomenal in every other aspect that i can overlook or even appreciate its gimmick and this would take us to the final boss in the base game of Dark Souls 3, the Soul of Cinder. This is essentially the culmination of all the Lords of Cinder, and, you know, with that comes a giant variety of moves, and a moveset that's on that honestly feels unfair at times with how many different attacks he has access to. However, it's not in an unfair or, like, annoying way. I would say, if I don't like this fight quite as much as the Twin Princes, I it's the second best thing. Your first impression, the fight might feel impossible at first, like, it's got healing mechanics it can passively heal it has an access to a ridiculous amount of magic uh it actually has great sword and melee based attacks as well it feels like it has everything and it has no weaknesses which in some sense is true however it, it, even though it has two phases you can prevent a lot of its uh, mechanics that give it a massive advantage such as healing or whatever but i would say as far as like visuals and presentation go it's excellent it's like immaculate even but mechanically i don't think it quite reaches the same level as the twin princes before it even though it has you know this giant variety and, and toolbox of moves it's definitely not the worst final boss we've ever seen in a souls game and it's just maybe its visuals are a little ambitious for what the mechanics actually are I, I think a lot of people just found this fight a little underwhelming not necessarily bad in any way just maybe oh i was maybe expecting a, a little more but it, it is what it is if you learned everything that the game is teaching you throughout your journey then you should have no problem with this fight theory Theoretically. The first flame quickly fades. Soul of Cinder would be it in terms of base game bosses. That's how it would cap out. And I would say, once again, there's really no, like, outwardly bad bosses. Just ones that I'm indifferent to, or ones that are just, like, kind of corny, but nothing, like, terrible. But I will say, in the DLC, they really kick it up a notch with bosses. And this is where things get interesting. The first fight you begin with is probably the worst one of the DLC offering. But that's, you know, it's a pretty high bar to set. It's still really good. The Champion's Grave Tender and then his Wolf. This is a duo fight in which, you know, the... Grave Tender Wolf is very aggressive and will run you down. And if you can take care of the Grave Tender first, you're going to be in a much better position. I didn't find this fight to be very difficult whatsoever. You do encounter the Great Wolf earlier in the game as a normal enemy, so you're actually kind of trained to know what this sort of thing can do, so you don't go in totally blind. But I, I would say they also have very good passive and aggressive states, so you're not that actively fighting two at once where it feels totally unfair. It's balanced, it's just not particularly challenging. It's probably like the, the weakest fight in the DLC period. And if this fight was a little bit of a, of a gimme, you know, it's a it's a bit of a cakewalk, the final boss of this area is absolutely not. Sister Frida and Father Ariandel, this is absolutely no joke. And what's so interesting about this fight is it is genuinely a marathon. You have three different unique phases in this fight. You fight Sister Frida on her own, in which she's very slow paced, but she has a fast moving scythe and she can even conceal herself and go invisible during the first stage of the battle. She takes a lot of damage and can be quite easily hit sunned, so no problem there really. But once you get into phase two, you now have to deal with her and Father Ariandel, and he's just swinging this big pot around. Man's going absolutely sicko mode in every single way. And I do have to say the atmosphere and tone of this fight is like so unforgettable. It's probably the one that sticks out in my memory the most. And also, not to mention, 
phase three, assuming you get past this and deal with all of those health bars and still have resources, Black Flame Sister Frida is probably where it gets the most mechanically fun. She's far less passive in this stage compared to her phase one, and you also have to deal with an insane damage output if you do get hit with these. Also, she had a she has a lot of moves that combo into one another, so getting hit by one minor move can actually end up in you getting completely deleted if you're not being careful. The phases are incredibly unique and mechanically excellent on their own. To be honest, a lot of the difficulty of this fight is due to it being an absolute resource marathon, and so that does artificially stretch it out just a little bit, but not in a way that makes me dislike this fight at all. Again, still an excellent, almost god-tier fight. For the most part, when I played the DLC, I was pretty unimpressed with Ashes of Ariandel, like the entire thing, the level design and even like the first boss, but when I got to Sister Frida, it completely made up for it, so I was absolutely okay with it. Now, moving on from that DLC, but the Ring City is the next DLC, and this has more bosses and I would even say better bosses, but the first one you're going to encounter are the Demon Twin fight, I guess, that becomes the Demon Prince. So this fight, essentially, the setup is you fight two separate entities, and and once you kill both, they kind of become one, and the Demon Prince is an absolute damage sponge. So, in the same way that the the previous fight was a bit of a resource marathon, so is this one, but again, in a duo fight that isn't unfair. The fact that they, able, they were able to balance this in a way that was so meticulous where it didn't feel annoying or that you were having to deal with too much at any given time is like, it's so smart. Also, it's another boss encounter that really does punish passive play. You kind of need to be under them, you need to be in their face and responding to the attacks that they throw out. But it's never too much that you can't deal with these two enemies swinging at the same time. When it becomes the Demon Prince, I would say this is where the fight reaches its highlight. It has a ton of health, let's be honest about that, but its moves are devastating, but not unfair or anything that you can't respond to, and so I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it's my favorite fight in the game ever. I, I would even prefer a lot of the base game bosses to this one, but for what it is, I do not have any problems with it really whatsoever. But now, after that, we get to the weirdest boss in the game, and I'm not even sure how to talk about this one, so Half-Light Spear of the Church is not really a boss fight exactly, so I think the way this works if you play offline you fight some kind of npc and i've never done it this way i've always ever played online and if you're doing so it becomes a pvp fight you literally fight a real online player but what i realize is like damn if people are you know going through the game and they're just having to be connected online and they like they're going to be matched up with people who have never logged off dark souls 3 in their entire lives who have never got off the game like the amount of people that are still playing pvp are like you know very sweaty hardcore dark souls 3 players nothing wrong that exactly but it's just how is that a boss fight to somebody who is maybe experiencing the game for the first time just seems a little weird you may want to just disconnect your console momentarily or play offline to get past this one if you're just getting smoked in pvp it's really weird it's experimental it's not even really a consistent boss fight you can talk about in the traditional way I just figured it would be interesting to mention. But after that, don't worry, we get a more traditional boss fight. Technically, it's like a secret area and it is optional, but it, it relates to a side quest and it's definitely part of the main game still of that offering. And this is Dark Eater Medir. Wait, I think I mispronounced that. I think it's uh I think it's Dark Eater Mid no, no, I'm just kidding. Now, I will say, yes, technically, this is probably one of the harder fights in the game in terms of, like, completions, but I think, again, it's done for slightly cheap reasons. I love Medir, don't get me wrong. I, I love the fact that it's brutal and it's ridiculous. It's an absolute sponge of damage for sure, but I would say it's mostly done through, like, one-time crazy gimmick moves like while you're learning the fight it's got a bunch of stuff in its toolkit that will probably delete you if you get touched by something once but once you learn that's what it can do then you sort of know where to be and where it's safe once you understand the move set of, of of this fight it becomes significantly less interesting I can admit that Medir is objectively a great boss fight. I actually don't think it's it's really bad in any objective way. It's just not my favorite kind of fight, if that makes sense. It's like, I guess I enjoy the more reactionary kind of, you know, like moment-to-moment -moment fights, like the Princes or Soul of Cinder, stuff like that, rather than like the big damage sponges that you need to be out of its threat range and then just weave in when it's safe. There's a time and place for that, and I like Medir. He's he's fast for a dragon, he's, he's like interesting and everything, and I love the arena it's awesome but i just you know it's not my favorite kind of archetype Hand it over, that thing, your dark soul. 
Now, the real final boss of Dark Souls 3 is Slave Knight Gale. This is the last fight in the DLC of the Ring City and what would be the final fight period. And so this is what I want out of a finale fight because it nails both the theme and atmosphere totally. Like I feel like a lot of, you know, final boss fights really get the thematic part right, but mechanically they can be, you know, a little inconsistent. We'll just put it that way. But Slave Knight Gale checks all the boxes because the atmosphere is impeccable and mechanically an actual masterpiece. For me, this fight is challenging, but it strikes that balance of not being too oppressive or feeling like it's relying on on something you know that's just not fun to play against its animations and frame data feel very fluid and natural and responsive and it also does an excellent job of feeling like the fight is escalating as it goes on it's got a couple of different phases and each time that happens the fight gets more intense from a visual perspective and also he unlocks more moves and mechanically gets more dangerous also, I love the fact that in between his second and third phase, he has moves that you get used to punishing in phase two, but then you have to completely change your approach and timing in phase three. You have to like slightly delay your punish and maybe pick a defensive option instead. It's like these kinds of things that keep you on your toes. The fight is also still a bit of a marathon. That's a, you know, a similar theme of a lot of these ones. I feel like the only minor complaint I have for this fight is this move where he shoots like these crossbow bolts or whatever. I don't even have a problem with this move mechanically. It's just that for some reason I don't know what it is it looks so out of place in this game like compared to the rest of his move set that is the one that sticks out to me and it feels like a mod I don't know how else to describe it but some of you may know what I mean it feels like someone like modded that in and it wasn't part of the original tools I don't know it just feels strange and, and out of place and it kind of looks goofy when it comes out but I get it it is what it is Besides that, once again, Slave Knight Gale is everything I want out of a finale boss. Like, this is the way to do it, in my opinion. They absolutely crushed it here. So all things considered here, I think Dark Souls 3 bosses base game and DLC are actually it's like strongest suit. It has a really high batting average. There's nothing that weighs it down really that much or anything that's like outwardly offensive or you just want to get past it. Like everything is at least moderately enjoyable, if not maybe just being a little indifferent to it. And then the highlights it does have are actual highlights. But where the rubber meets the road for me, what makes Dark Souls 3 so special is its ability to dial in on a specific experience. Everything from visuals to music to sound to level design to bosses to side quest, everything that Dark Souls 3 does I feel like is not only palatable for new players, but will also satisfy more hardcore players at the same time. It's that being able to reach both audiences is what I think it makes such a widely appealing game. Everything is working in concert to bring the experience that Dark Souls 3 is, and if you've never had it for yourself, then I cannot recommend it enough. It was a wonderful experience to revisit even in modern day and I have no shame in saying that this is a game that probably will age the most gracefully as time goes on.